Okay, we'll probably call this a full barn. Um, so today we've got three presentations. Um, we've got uh, Florian, we've got Patrick, and we've got Sarah, all trying things. So thank you all. Um, maybe we'll just go in that order if folks are okay with that. Uh, Florian, you wanna kick things off? Oh. All right, so um, I will be talking a little bit about area rechunking, about the current state of the say algorithms we are developing. So we have the traditional tasks-based uh, rechunking and the newer uh, P2P-based rechunking that's uh, using a, the same backend as the uh, new data frame shuffling. Um, the situation for areas is actually a little bit more complex. I'll basically just show where we are, why we are, why the, it is good where we are, and why it is bad at the same time. What we can look at, how how we during development actually look at such a problem. Um, if there are any questions while I'm talking, just shout or post it into the chat. Um, and otherwise, I will just uh, walk through this and then show you what I got. All right. So what is Rechunking, maybe first, and um, for this I have basically an example. This is actually very similar to one of our customer problems. So uh, arrays, multi-dimensional data. This is a three-dimensional array with a certain shape, um, x, y, z, for instance. This could be time, longitude, latitude, or whatever kind of coordinates you have. Um, and for instance, in this example where this is coming from, this is actually satellite data. So what you can uh, think of this is uh, basically the satellite takes a snapshot of a certain region, maybe every hour or every day, every month, something like this. And this is also how the data will then be partitioned. Like so, uh, there's this nice visual right uh, right uh, that shows uh, say um, slices in the c-axis. Uh, 60,000 of those, and then relatively large slices on the X and Y axis. These are basically pictures, for instance, and the, the C axis is the time axis. And um, often uh, when working with this kind of data, we actually need a different slicing of this data because, um, for instance, we want to calculate for a certain, I don't know, city, a an average or a historic average of temperature or something like this. I'm not a domain expert. I'm just, I get told that this is the kind of operation we need. And uh, say for folks that are more uh, used to data frame applications, this is something like group by apply. And um, the API is actually pretty pretty straightforward. We say, okay, we take a source chunk or a partition in the data frame world, how big it should be and how big it should be after the rechunking. Uh, and this minus one just says, please put everything in one uh, chunk. So we get from this, say, thin sliced in the, the time dimension, we get very long, uh, say, rods of data. And this is the rechunking operation. Uh, and traditionally, we are, we are doing this with a task based approach. And um, um, I will go into this in a, in a bit, but Basically, this is a many-to-many -many or if not all-to-all -all communication. So this is actually very expensive. So basically every old chunk has to share a bit of its data with the new chunk. So there's a lot of network communication between workers. And to make this really smooth, the traditional approach is actually take, uh, slicing this up into multiple stages. And this example, actually four stages. And this is why it's actually not incredibly fast. Uh, I prepared a cluster. Um, I think I prepared one. I hope this is up. If not, we have to wait for a minute or so. Yes, it is up. So I'm using Coil uh, just as an example, but you can use whatever you want. I have a cluster with 20 workers, um, one CPU, eight gig each, and I'm just running this simple example. And I'm of course sharing uh, the dashboard in a second. Uh, I'm not doing anything sophisticated here, just rechunking the data and throwing everything away afterwards. And then I'm, I'm just looking at the dashboard. This is the traditional task-based approach. Uh, what we can see is that there's a lot of red stuff. This is network communication. That's good and all well. In the upper left corner, that's bytes stored per worker. So it is actually using a relatively large amount of memory, but it's fine still because I'm actually using relatively little data. But we can see it becomes yellow. Uh, this is bad. So there's a lot of memory pressure. And um, if I have, would have chosen a much bigger problem, chances are that my cluster would actually trip, fall over, die a horrible death because some kind of you know workers are dying. 
Uh, this will run for about a minute. And in the meantime, we can actually look into what's going on here um, because we were, of course, uh, we were thinking about performance here. So um, sorry for jumping around. Um, I'm so coil is, for instance, showing uh, network uh, throughput and uh, throughput and so on. And we can see that this class is actually using network pretty pretty uh, strongly. So we see here this median transfer rate of about 300 megabytes. This is actually more or less what you can expect as a maximum. How you can uh, get this kind of number uh, is something I will also show you in a bit. But um, basically, this class was pretty well utilized. The CPU is at, at, at its threshold. The network is at its threshold. Memory is pretty well utilized. And we are not stealing any disks. So from a first glance, this looks actually pretty great. But this is what I said before. We have actually this multi-stage approach. So we are rechampling four times for this operation. And this is why this is actually not optimal. This is why we've been starting uh, to develop something new, also because this frequently runs out of memory. Now, um, this ran for about 110 seconds. I can do now the same thing with our new software method that is called P2P. And what we will then see is no red stuff. Actually, P2P is much smoother. It, uh, you can see that the, the bytes stored per worker is actually very well under control. Um, it doesn't use, well, well, it uses almost no memory, actually. It uses this, though, behind the scenes. But the important point is this is very smooth and stable. So even if you have very large data to, to, to rechunk, um, this is expected to work regardless of the data size. This is scaling very well. I didn't show this before, but we also don't have as many task tasks for those who are familiar with this kind of thing. But, and this is the say, um, downside of the thing here, this is actually slower. Um, so the previous one uh, ran for 110 seconds. This one will probably run for, I don't know, two to three minutes. Uh, I still think this is a success. And this is because the bytes per worker this is stable. Everything is very stable. Everything is very smooth, and this just runs along. Um, but can we make this even better? And for this, we can also look at, at, the, at the performance metrics again. And we can see it is actually not using a lot of network. It is using a lot of disk. Um, so can we somehow move this along? Can we reduce the disk usage? Can we increase the network usage? And this is basically how we are informing our, our development workflow. So what we are currently doing is looking into, can we make the disk optional or use it just partially such that we can utilize other resources a little bit stronger? Because this P2P uh, algorithm is actually doing it just once, uh, this is rechecking operation. And we can see that, say, the disk, uh, we see this is limited to something like 120 to 130. This is because the disk is not much faster. So this is all resources are working very smoothly together. And this is our attention. Uh, can I even move to a larger example? Again, so this is just the same cluster, but with say 200 workers, uh, but a little bit more data. So this is now generating about two terabytes and I'm rechunking to something similar. So same dimensions, same chunk sizes, etc. And let's look how this runs. So this is now the bigger cluster. Um, this is also why we see um, histograms instead of actually bar plots. And the first thing you should notice is that nothing happens. <laughs> uh, this is because Doug actually has to submit a relatively large graph. We see that there are 120,000 tasks. And now it's it's running and running. This is a traditional task-based approach. And the upper left corner, this is the total um, cluster memory usage, and it is already yellow. We are basically just 10, 20 seconds in. And this will move along like this. So memory is all over the place. Uh, I actually cannot tell you if this will finish. Sometimes during testing ahead of this, it finished. Sometimes it failed. Um, but this is roughly how yeah, people are experiencing this. You know, the dashboard is actually laggy because the schedule behind the scenes is actually um, well, a bottleneck in this kind of situation. Um, we can even see this also by looking at our dashboard. Um, big one. 
So this doesn't look like bottleneck to the scheduler right here, but it's just because our access is, is a little bit off. But basically, it's it's almost at 100 percent. So the CPU is constantly doing stuff, and this is bad. Network is properly utilized, sure, but our memory we already see that this is actually close to dying. Uh, I will spare you uh, waiting for this because I don't have any confidence. And let's just start a client for good measure. And then we do the same thing with P2P. And this is basically now what we are looking for. What we should be seeing right now is that, well, first of all, it started much, much more quicker, much more quickly. And um, Again, same thing. It's it's running smoothly, constant memory. Um, this is what what this P2P is about. But the performance is not where we want it to be. There is still room for improvement, and this is basically what we can see in, in our hardware metrics. Um, can again look look here. This is not refreshing super quickly, but yeah, disk is used. The scheduler is much more healthy, maybe on the dashboard. Yeah, so this shows the scheduler CPU uh, before and after. So everything is much more healthy now, but we are paying a little bit of a price for performance. Um, That's also the reason why this is currently still opt-in, um, but we're working on it. But boring is good. In this case, boring is good. Anyhow, this is actually everything I have to say, wanted to say. If there are any questions, um, I'm happy to answer or dive into specific topics. I had a question on the on the Got it. difference in, in performance here. Are there cases, of course. if you're okay with the slight decrease in performance, are there cases where you still might want to use the task-based reshuffling? Or is it something where... Uh, if you're if you're okay with a small performance decrease, that you have a strong preference for for P2P. So the thing is that um, if you are doing large scale, you know, really large data processing, you are probably better off with P2P because of the stability uh, thing. Um, but the devil's in the detail. But the example I'm currently showing is basically something like an orthogonal rechunking, right? Um, there are also very trivial cases where you just take the end chunks and smash them together into one, or you take a big chunk and break it apart. Um, this is also why, why the traditional task space shuffle has multiple stages, because it expresses a much more complex problem as a series of these trivial ones, where we just break a chunk apart, smash them together again, maybe break it apart again, um, and the, the P2P thing does everything in one. So if you have a rechunk that is actually one of these trivial operations, the task space is currently better um, because it also runs very, very smooth uh, and uh, requires not a lot of memory. But as soon as you have these non-trivial um, operations, um, things beca uh, become more complex. So basically, um, if your target chunk is a multiple of the source chunk, this is a very trivial operation and uh, P2P cannot do better. We are also working on heuristics that can detect this and switch between the algorithms, but we don't have uh, anything reliable yet. And we choose to not um, surprise users, um, rather educate them and tell them that in most situations they should opt in unless everything runs super smooth. Okay, uh, thanks, Lauren. Uh, Patrick, you're up next. So I want to talk about Dusk Expressions today. Um, Dusk Expressions is an effort that tries to build query optimizing into Dusk data frame for now, but is set up to integrate this into all parts of the Dusk API. Historically, um, Dusk wasn't very good at um, reordering your queries that you handed over to the scheduler. It just executed what you provided um, and thus tended to do unnecessary work. This is like a comparison against where Spark is much better than Dask at the moment, but we're trying to catch up here. Um, I'll go through a quick example that shows um, what Dask expressions is supposed to do. 
And then we'll move over to some performance comparison that we did over the last couple of weeks to see um, where we at where we are at the moment. Um, this query here um, reads a parquet file, then we do some operations, and in the end we select a single number. Um, this is obviously not very efficient. Um, we read all the data, um, execute all operations on um, the whole data frame, and then we want to get one single number in the end. Um, we can do this better manu manually um, through pushing the column projection that's here at this place um, into the read parquet call which will restrict the number of columns we read to one um, instead of like everyone. Depending on the size of the um, files, um, this could be a pretty big improvement. Um, and then we'll get the same result. Um, it will just run faster now. Um, these optimizations aren't very cool to do manually. Um, if you have hundreds of thousands of columns, then you don't want to um, write them up all the time um, so that you can get the best out of um, you query. So that's why some frameworks like Spark or Polars are doing this automatically. That's what we are doing with Dask Expressions as well now. So um, Dask Expressions is currently a separate library. Um, it lives in the Dask Contrib um, organization. It's just a GitHub project, it's Python only. So installation should be relatively easy if you want to install for main, but we're also doing regular releases. Um, it follows the API of the Dask data frame um, interface pretty um, closely. So if you look at the same query here, um, if you don't do anything, if you just write it up with Dask expressions, then we'll just capture the user intent, which is reading the file um, down here, doing the replace, summing up, and then um, selecting the column A, which will result in a single value. Um, before actually executing this thing on the scheduler, uh, on the cluster, um, there are a couple of optimization steps that will reorder the query um, that the user provided to make something more efficient out of it. Um, like this is not meant to be public API, it's just for illustration purposes here. Um, what happens is the column selection from A up here um, moves all the way down here. so. Basically, it automates what we did earlier um, in a manual step. This happens for all kinds of operations. Um, column projection is just the simplest one that is um, that resonates very well with uh, users who haven't thought deeply about this. Um, but in general, we can also like push filters around, um, do more efficient merges if you have more information about the data. Um, like set index won't trigger computations anymore when you write them up. So we postpone these until um, we know more about what the query is actually supposed to do. So we can tackle a lot of the annoying things from a UX point of view that um, Dask data frame um, is currently ha having. Um, so um, we have a coiled benchmarks repository where we were running benchmarks regularly, um, micro benchmarks, where Dask Expressions is like, sometimes it's a bit faster, sometimes it's a bit slower um, because these queries are very very short. So they are optimized manually by whoever um, added them. That's why we moved over to the TPCH benchmarks, which is a benchmark set that's um, SQL-like that was initially created to compare um, databases. Um, these are more complex. Um, we will look at one of the queries shortly. And this gives us a better um, idea of what users are facing in the wild. Um, like writing a group by operation and read parquet is not really representative for most of the use cases. Um, so I spun up a cluster that we will use shortly for benchmarking. Um, what TPCH looks like, it's generally a filter, um, which is in here. Um, then we do some merges or other operations. And most of the time it finishes up with a group I operation. It's typical stuff that you would write in SQL as well if you want to do so, if you wanted to do some analysis. Um, this is a bit more complex than just like a one liner. So we can expect to see a bit more here. Um, what we will do now is I have this window open here and we have that one. Um, the left side is the task expressions implementation. 
and the right side um, is the, the current DAS data frame implementation. And what we will now is do is we will look at how they compare against each other. And then I can say a couple of things about how this is going to work. So right is DAS data frame and left is DAS expressions. Um, the data set has 100 gigabytes. Um, so it's like medium sized, I would say. Um, we are currently working on running this on um, one terabyte and then 10 terabytes so that it gives us a bit of a better idea. Um, how this will look like for bigger use cases. <clears throat> I think I screwed something up here. The left side should be much faster. Just a second. I think the widgets are pointing to the same cluster. Ah, that would explain that. Um, then let's look at the actual cluster. No, not oh, maybe not. That's very weird. We will restart this in a moment. Maybe I forgot to refresh this read step here. We'll find out. Otherwise, I have prepared benchmarks as well. Um, uh, show this a little bit better. Yeah, this is more what I expected. So what we can see is this had like a one or two second late start, but um, we can see that the left side is already mostly finished while this one is still um, stumbling around at probably like maybe 20% of the workload it has to do. Um, in general, if you look at the query just a tiny little bit, um, in the end, what we want here is like two columns these two, while we read in two files and both of them have over 20 columns. So what the data frame is doing, it reads up, it reads in all these um, columns and probably reads in a lot, around 150 gigabytes of data with these two um, data frames together, while Dask Expressions is able to reduce this to probably like 10 to 15% of that. Um, which is especially helpful if you do shuffling based workloads because like it's similar to what um, Florian showed a little bit ago with rechunking, we have to send a lot of data around. And if we can reduce that by a lot, then we will get a lot faster. Um, so this is obviously only one query. Um, We've run this on um, seven different queries from the TPCH benchmark set. And what we can see here, blue is good. Um, like blue means that we got uh, a lot uh, that we got faster compared to dask data frame implementation. So based on the TPCH stuff, um, which are a bit more complex than micro benchmarks, um, we mostly get a we um, exclusively get a performance improvement. Um, obviously, what we discussed earlier, we are reading significantly less data than before. So um, the average memory comparison and peak memory comparison is also significantly lower which might be helpful if users are struggling with a memory pressure instead of um, instead of performance. Like some maybe performance doesn't really matter to some users, but they have problems figuring out um, huge, uh, using huge clusters um, for their data. Um, if you look at this like briefly on a test by test comparison, um, these three benchmarks here are especially merge heavy. Um, so and there we got a like two to three um, times improvement. Um, so it looks pretty promising as of now. Um, the project is still like under development. So we haven't done everything that we would like to do. So I expect this to get even a bit faster in a couple of weeks. Um, generally, it's ready for use though. Um, so if um, you are an early user or want to play around with it, um, it's ready. The API coverage is pretty good. Um, we cover like probably 90%, maybe 85% of the Dask data frame API and like more like 99% of the regular used part of the Dask data frame API. There are a couple of more esoteric things that we haven't implemented yet, but the important stuff should be um, there. 
um, long term, we want to integrate this into Dask um, so that we can switch over by default at some point. Um, but it's not yet clear when this will happen. Yeah, that's it. Do we have any questions? I have a question. Sure. You mentioned this is still in development and people can try it out. However, um, how safe it is, is it? Did you re-implement all the algorithms and now I have to expect that there are major bugs, uh, maybe data loss or something like this. So what, what's my, my, my risk when, when I try this? Um, the risk is that you run into noisy bugs that won't let your workflow run at all. Um, like some more complicated things like data loss or stuff like that is unlikely to happen. Um, we dispatch to the task algorithms wherever possible, which is basically everywhere. It's just that we have um, uh, injected a step before the actual algorithms are used and doing some stuff with the query now before we submit it to the scheduler. But so if my, I, my tests and my, my notebooks just run, I should be safe and, and uh, good to go. That's good news. How can people try this out, Patrick? Uh, pip or Conda. It's on Conda Forge and on PyPI. Uh, or install from main. As I said, it's only it's Python only. So installing from source should be very straightforward. I think you should just have to basically swap out your import, right? That should be the main uh, yeah, that's change. What we do for our benchmarks is um, instead of implement, importing Dask data frame as DD, we imp uh, import Dask expressions as DD, and then they run just out of the box. Like, oh, benchmarks um, are running out of the box. Then. We're not cheating, I promise. <laughs> OK. Thanks, Patrick. If there are no other questions, then uh, Sarah, you're up next. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Sarah. I uh, I work for Coiled. I think this is my first Dask Demo Day presentation. So thanks, everyone. Um, Deepak, I see you were able to join, too. This example that I'm going to talk to uh, actually started from something that Deepak put together. So um, yeah, I'll, I, can, I can start, and then maybe put you on the spot a little bit to Deepak to talk about uh, some of the some of the details. Sounds good. Great. Uh, so this, yeah, uh, this all started with an example that, that Deepak put together. So uh, there's this really big data set called the National Water Model. Um, Deepak is you know working on or not working on you can use flox to reduce this really big data set um Deepak has like a really nice example using um like faster group by with flox and x-ray uh for one year of this data set and we thought hey how hard could it be to scale this up to the full data set so for one year it's about six terabytes um and the full the full 42 years is like 250 terabytes so we thought yeah let's let's scale this up and and see what happens um so uh we did we did scale it up and we had some problems i think before before i go into that i just want to talk a little bit about so historically um this is just the the blog post that we put together on this, but um, there, there have been a lot of problems historically with using Dask with X-Ray at scale. Uh, so this example was also part of demonstrating feasibility around that. Um, I think a lot of other folks here have felt that pain more than me personally, but you know, problems with rechunking that Florian mentioned at the very beginning, um, sort of all of that, uh, unmanaged memory, data, Dask being too eager to load in the data. Um, and some of those things has have been fixed, especially like the too eager data loading piece, um, but not everything. So this kind of talks about some of the some of the ways, some of the ways that this was actually not that hard. Um, and then other things that we'd like to try in the future, um, especially with it kind of ties in nicely to um, the P2P shuffling that Florian mentioned 
at the beginning, but none of this uses any of that. So, so far they are separate. Um, so yeah, so we, we tried to run it. Um, one year of data, just fine. Um, then I went on to use, I did like 10 years of data. And the first thing that happened to me was a scheduler bottleneck. So this is just showing this is showing an old cluster for, oh, sorry, this is 20 years of data. So, um, but you can see the scheduler is at 100%. There's bottlenecking. There's a lot of idle. So this is zoomed in. But if you zoom out, there's like a lot of idle. You've got spilling to disk. Um, so it seemed like the next obvious step was to increase the chunk sizes. Um, so, so I did that. Uh, and unfortunately there was some user error in increasing the chunk sizes. So I naively, instead of, so in our full example, you can specify chunks as part of the open czar call. What I did at first was to just read this in and then call dot chunk, which adds in an extra rechunk. Um, that was terrible. So you can see like, like this is not good, so much idle. And like, I kept feeding it more and more memory and it just kept spilling the disk. I was like, what is going on? Uh, turns out, yeah, you don't need that. Don't need that extra rechunk. Um, so after, you know, sp specifying the chunks in the right way, uh, things looked, things looked a lot better. So this is, these are the metrics from like a happy cluster, as I would say. Um, so you can see there's, uh, we're not spilling to disk anymore. There's like this sort of like constant memory usage. Um, things are looking a lot smoother as far as, you know, all of these workers are busy. Um, that's exciting. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the, the main hurdles that we went through. Um, the, other, the other piece that we ended up having a little bit of trouble with, and this is related to the rechunking or sorry, related to the um, finding the right chunk sizes. So the um, the task graph is also pretty large here. So there was also some lag in downloading the task graph to my client. Um, so I also used another utility um, that Coiled has, but um, which would just launch this cluster from um, from a remote VM in the first place. So instead of using my own internet speeds, um, I can like do that from another remote VM in the same region as the as the cluster that this is running on. So that helped speed things up a little bit too. Um, yeah, and then the only other thing I wanted to, to show, and then I think it'd be cool, um, maybe if Deepak, you wanted to talk a little bit about the Flux piece. Um, is I also put together a short animation of all of this, which is kind of fun. Um, but this is just looking at all, all 42 years of data um, at the county level. So what this, what this operation is doing is it's taking the full data set from the national water model and doing using clocks to do a reduction on it um, across the counties. And then I did an average across each week. So, um, and then kind of put this together to be able to look at it all in one place. Um, but yeah, Deepak, did you want to talk about Flux a little bit? That's like kind of the main, one of the main bits, um, or if other folks have questions. Um, sure. I could say <clears throat> a few sentences. Um, the idea behind Flux was that group by reductions were a problem because by default, X-Ray tries to shuffle the entire data set and this doesn't work very well. Um, so instead we write group by reductions as a tree reduction. Um, and then, so using Dask Array reduction um, and then everything works really well because these are giant reductions. Um, even if you start with a big data set, you're usually collapsing to pretty coarse groups. And so, in theory, this should work pretty well in parallel as long as you write it with an appropriate algorithm. And so that's what Flux does. Um, it, so that's fundamentally what it is. And so it works well for that demo where you're going spatially aggregating into county groups. Um, it gets more interesting when you start doing group by in time. Uh, now, then you have to start thinking a bit uh, because you could fail pretty easily with arrays 
uh, we can get into this, but you know, things like time dot day of year is like a quasi periodic pa repeating pattern. Um, something like time dot hour of day is an exactly periodic pattern, and something like resampling is every group is sequential and you know, occurs next to each other. And so you can look at these patterns and um, so anyway, so Flux writes, lets you do a group by with a tree reduction and then has some tricks uh, if, to let you op, uh, optimize looking at the patterns of groups, which tends to happen with time-based grouping. Um, yeah, and I guess there's a link to a blog post. I'll throw in a link to the repo there too, if you're more interested in uh, what it does. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Deepak. Thanks, Sarah. Only kind of tangentially related. Um, Sarah, what'd you use to make the animation? That's cool to see. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I so I used, I actually, it's just um, matplotlib for the individual plots. And then I used uh, a tool called ffmpeg to stitch them all together into an animation. Um, cool. Yeah, okay. I can I can drop a link in the chat too, but that seemed to be the easiest, um, yeah, the easiest way to, to do that. Everything else I found, like I know matplotlib has the like update function, like they have an animation option for that, um, but it was, uh, yeah, a little more annoying for me to figure out how to make it actually happen. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Okay. I guess that'll do it then. Um, just as a reminder, we have uh, another demo day, uh, another month from now. If folks have any, have been working on something interesting or have colleagues who have been working on something, you know, task related that's you, you think other folks would uh, like to see, then uh, please uh, chime in and uh, feel free to present next month. So with that, I guess I will see you all next month. Thanks, everyone.